and we have to really escalate the noise we make so that we'll be heard. Welcome to Gay USA. I'm Andy Hum. And who is this stranger sitting next to you? <laughs> it's been well, a while. Hello, Ann. Hello, Lovely Andy. To have you. I'm Ann Northrup. I, I'm here off and on, but I'm here this week. Thank you to Rachel Lipstein for sitting in for me last week. Thank you to Chris Cooper, who is sitting in for me next week. And then you're stuck with me for the foreseeable future. All right. And, and uh, the USA is a little gayer today because the president had a terrible week. Uh, that is wishful thinking, if ever I heard it. Anne is going to explain how I'm, I'm wishful. But uh, nevertheless, despite all the president's troubles, uh, the Republicans are full steam ahead to get that Brett Kavanaugh confirmed. That is horrible news. Uh, strange news out of Colorado. It turns out that the whole lawsuit against the Masterpiece Cake Shop for rejecting a wedding cake for a same-sex couple was only half the story because there was also a rejection of a cake for a transgender woman and that has been going back and forth and now the cake shop owner is suing Colorado. We will explain all this. Uh, a retirement home outside of St. Louis has rejected a lesbian couple for residents. I detect a theme here. Uh, we mourn the loss of several giants this week. Uh, peace activist David McReynolds uh, and another great activist Melanie K. Kantrowitz as well as the big Hollywood producer Craig Zayden. Uh, in Austria, uh, an officer there rejected a gay asylum seeker for not dressing gay and for being antisocial. This. Unlike gay people. <laughs> this is one of our favorite stories of the week. <laughs> uh, police in Malaysia have raided a gay club that's been around for 30 years. You'd think they'd have noticed before now. And we have some coming outs to announce. Uh, actors Garrett Clayton and Josie Tota. Did I say that right? I believe so, but okay. what do I know? All right. Uh, so uh, President Trump has had what looks like a bad week with the conviction of uh, Paul Manafort on a number of count, eight counts and the guilty plea of uh, Michael Cohen to another eight counts. I know. My, my friend Tony's blood pressure went down for the first time in two <laughs> years, literally in two years. Well, I'd love to think this is the beginning of the end, but honestly, do you think his voters care? Well, his voters, his voters, I mean, they are a minority in this country. And, and what I keep explaining to people about the election that's coming up in November, which is so important, is that, yes, they're solid. People say, oh, they're so fearful of impeachment now and not letting the Democrats get control that they're going to come out in greater numbers. They don't have greater numbers. They had a bona fide racist to vote for in 2016. They all came out. There aren't any more of them. He didn't. He hasn't won any converts since he got elected. So, And people who didn't want to vote for Hillary or whatever the hell went on, or other Democrats, they're like, I want to stop the bleeding. I want to get out. They're, oh, they're going to come off the sidelines. I'm, I'm not overconfident about, I'm, I'm fairly sure we're going to win the House back. The Senate is now a possibility, and it didn't look like that. So that's where I am. Uh, I don't disagree with any of that. But we are also living in a very lopsided, unfair country where uh, Congress is composed of uh, an inordinate number of people representing a tiny minority yes. of the population. It's because all of the out Senate. of whack. Because yes. of the Senate and because of the way districts are apportioned in the states. Yes, it's some outrageous number, like, you know, 60% of the Senate represents 14% of Correct. the population. It's awful. It S was done to protect slavery, folks. That's That was the original thing, which is why I want to invoke the Declaration of Independence and say this is intolerable and we have to find a way out of it and I'm not you know exaggerating well, and we meanwhile, do meanwhile meanwhile they are uh, going right ahead and throwing everybody off the voter rolls uh, yes. who they don't want to vote they're closing polling places all over the country where they uh, think too many Democrats are voting yes. they are lying to the American people about all sorts of issues they are scared. very good at it they're scaremongering about you know 
illegal aliens killing Americans. Uh, they are going on and that on. That was and at on. the top of Fox News last night. Yeah, of course, My, it I was. tuned in. Of course, and that is before they be, got to the president's troubles. Well, that is at the top of uh, the Trump speeches, and it will be for the next two months. And but and he's it, maxed out on voters. And I realize that the voter suppression has helped them all along. Uh, and, sure. and, you know, look, I, I said to... He I, lost the election uh, two years we ago, are not, but he won. We are not going to solve America's crisis unless we have a new system of government, uh, uh, the way we apportion things. We are not going to solve the problems. You can't just put Couldn't better people more. into these things. The same thing with the Catholic Church and all their problems. All these people say, you know, oh, this bishop's got to go. This bishop's got to go. The whole system has to go. And if you don't change the system so that you Catholics are controlling who you hire as your priests and then elect as your bishops, nothing's going to change in the Catholic Church. God is designated. Oh, priests. yeah, yeah. That's what they'd like to believe. <laughs> you know, if you don't do something about this, Catholics, you're responsible for all this molestation. Well, you are. you could say the same <clears throat> about uh, the voters of the United States. Yes. But again, while I agree with you yeah. about the limits of his popularity and the fact that more and more people are getting upset at him and may want to go out and do something, vast numbers of people in this country have no idea what's going on. They do not follow the news. They've never heard of Paul Manafort or Michael Cohen. They don't know about these convictions, even if it is all over the front page of the newspaper and the top of the news, because they're not following that stuff. And they think it's too esoteric. They don't think, they do not think, that uh, Donald Trump has committed any crime worse than uh, improving the, the economy. And if they're watching TV, Brett Kavanaugh is a great guy. Exactly. He's just, he's got such a great demeanor. He's so fair. <laughs> they're running, what is it? All these Seven, women. $7.5 million worth of ads uh, for women, him. Women, women supporting yep. him. And we're running 1.3 million mostly. And of course, this money uh, for them is doing double duty because they're running the ads in Alabama, West Virginia, uh, uh, North Dakota, Maine, Alaska, and Indiana, yep. where there are vulnerable uh, people that they want to go after to yeah. make sure that they vote for them. So, you know, uh, that's where we are on that. But, uh, you know, this week, of course, the only hope seemed to be, could might Susan Collins, who was supposed to be pro-choice, she was very concerned that whoever gets on the court will declare Roe v. Wade to be settled law. So Kavanaugh comes out and says, it's settled law. Well, of course it is. <laughs> Trump said that about same-sex marriage right after the election on 60 Minutes. It's settled. Until. It's unsettled <laughs> when a new Supreme Court, led by Br Brett Kavanaugh, says, no, you can't have an abortion anymore. So, in fact, it doesn't matter about Trump. Uh, it doesn't matter whether he is impeached. If Brett Kavanaugh is on the Supreme Court, that is what is going to screw us till the end of time. And I will, and I will say this, I've said it again, I write this on Facebook all the time to people, the, the way the Republicans have screwed with the federal courts and the way they've kept Democrats from being allowed to confirm judges under Obama, I mean, for years. The only way to change that is for them to change the Judiciary Act. It's an act of Congress. It is not the Constitution. Or for us to take control again. No, the Constitution does not say how many Supreme Court justices there are, nor how many federal judges there are. Yeah. All they would have to do is expand the number of justices, which they are free to do, and was done frequently in the 19th century, and they just, all of a sudden it got like, oh, nine is some sacred number. It is not. And it would be the, within the power of the Democrats to do that if they took power in all three branches again. Meanwhile. And that's not pie in the sky. That's what they have to do, or you're right. We have no protection from the federal courts. Zip. Zero. Meanwhile, this Sunday, the 26th of August, there are going to be protests around the country about the nomination of Brett Kavanaugh to the Supreme Court. So if you want to go out and have your voice heard in that way, you can go check out where the demonstration in your area is by going to actact.moveon. Dot org, and you can find out uh, where the local demonstration well, is for us here in New York, noon at City Hall well, on Sunday. You know, I mean, 
What's going to make any difference? Uh, the Democrats are trying assiduously, including trying to issue FOIL requests to try to find out his record when he worked for George W. Bush, when he worked on, uh, at some level, same-sex marriage and the constitutional amendment against well, it. Well, uh, you yes, the constitutional amendment against it and the uh, state constitutional amendments that were proposed all around the country to help George Bush get elected, yes. reelected in 2004. Yes. And he was there in the White House at that time, and uh, clearly he worked on that kind of stuff. So uh, we need to know a lot more whether any of that will interfere with his uh, elevation will. to the Supreme Court. Uh, they've never, Unlikely. it's never bothered them before. None of this, none of, nothing is bothering well, this Senate. I, I said at the beginning, the only way you really knock off a nominee, although Bork was a, an exception because, uh, you know, he was, his, he, oh, was, he so, was outrageous. He was so right wing and yeah. uh, quite upfront about it, yeah. uh, which nobody is anymore. But uh, you have to find some personal peccadillo or corruption uh, in order to get them. And that's what they We have used to, to be able on. to knock off Hainsworth and Carswell and who was the woman that Bush uh, wanted oh, to God, appoint? Yes. Myers. The, yeah, Harriet Myers. Yes, thank you. Well, she was just incompetent. Right. Unqualified. Well, I think it was uh, uh, Carswell uh, under Nixon. Uh, he was characterized as being quite mediocre, and a senator actually said, "Well, shouldn't we have some representing mediocre people <laughs> on the Supreme Court?" It right. was an amusing moment. Also in Trump news. Uh, in the transgender service member case in Maryland, the federal judge there rejected the administration's attempt to shield information used to implement the ban. They don't want to release it. Well, this is uh, my favorite subject because when Trump announced the ban, first announced it in, I think, July of 2017, over a in year a tweet? ago. In a tweet, it was all because the Tea Party members of the House of Representatives uh, wanted to stop funding by the military of trans health care. Yes. And he decided he would go one further and he put out this tweet without consulting anyone. And then including the Secretary of Defense. Yes, and then tried to claim ex post facto that he had consulted all the generals and everything. So now uh, and the people who had been lobbying him were the Family Research Council, Tony Perkins, and the few nutcases in Congress. Tony Perkins, who Congress. will be vice president under Mike Pence once uh, exactly. uh, uh, Trump is impeached. A good point. So uh, now the court has said you must produce the documents that uh, were related to the announcement of this ban, and they're going to have to come up with all this stuff about all of Tony Perkins' visits to the White House and meetings with Trump about this, and it's going to be quite interesting. And that Betsy DeVos is still at it when it comes to transgender students. She has halted at least five investigations into anti-trans discrimination in schools, but basically they've said they're not interested in the subject anyway. No, they, they keep throwing it out. Well, we've had this case in Oklahoma of the uh, trans teen, uh, Maddie, uh, whose family has now raised over $45,000 to help them move back to Texas to the Houston area yep. after the school closed down for two days, after she used uh, the female restroom. Uh, it, it's this is a 12 year old. There. Yes. Well, the and, oldest daughter lives in Houston and they're going to be happier there. Yes. And uh, when the story came out of her existence, there was a lot of hate tweeting and Facebooking and really well, vicious one attacks. one parent posted about this, but then, and then people from around the country yes. started chiming in. So one of the people who chimed in from around the country turns out to be a pilot for Frontier Airlines. Let's say his name, Kevin Bikerstaff. And Frontier has now suspended him. Uh, Pending an investigation. Because he urged violence against this trans No, he team. said he encouraged the ki other kids to beat the hell out of her yeah. so she wouldn't come back. That's nice. Uh, you're in good hands. Well, he can go work for, uh, what is it, Alaska Airlines. <laughs> <laughs> oh, maybe not. That may be a little unfair. Yeah, it is, I know. It was a cheap shot, but it Alaska was. Airlines it, had a big it was problem a cheap couple shot. of weeks ago. Yes, they did. I know. Ann loves Alaska Airlines. No, I have no relation with Alaska Airlines at all. 
but in other stories of di discrimination, a gay cop in San Francisco yeah. is suing for sexual harassment on the job in San Francisco. And uh, we have well, a picture of him. And uh, this is not the first story we've heard of discrimination against LGBT people in the San Francisco Police well, Department. Well, you know, after uh, the white night, after the Harvey Milk, uh, Harvey Milk's killer was let off and there were all these riots, the police retaliated, and there, some police cars were burned, the police retaliated heavily and, and busted up people in gay bars and things like that, and that uh, was... Well, look, cops in New York are still doing chokeholds. Right. Uh, inappropriate. And not like. apologizing for the stone wall or for the ongoing arrest yes. of trans women while walking. Yeah. Uh, all right. And in uh, Missouri, in a suburb of St. Louis, the time, New York Times did a big uh, feature story this week about a case that uh, has been going on for a while. A lesbian couple there. Uh, well, they wanted to move into a continuing care retirement home called, are you ready? Friendship Village Sunset Hills. There Such a they nice are. name. Yeah. Mary Walsh and Beverly Nance. Yeah. And they put down a deposit. They put their house on the market. They're ready to move in. And they were they they finally hey. figured out, "Oh, your spouse is a woman." Well, the home called them and said, "What is your relationship?" Cuz they had toured the place. They had been greeted with great uh, friendliness and and graciousness, but then it dawns on this Because place. if you, if we're gonna recognize you as a married couple, it has to be marriage as understood in the Bible. That is what they said to them. So NCLR, uh, National Center for Lesbian Rights, and ACLU are suing them for sex discrimination because they're not protected under sexual orientation there. Uh, and there's no Missouri statewide law. Now this is a retirement community that is a non-denominational religious uh, community, so they claim. Right. I don't know how they manage that, but that's what they're claiming, and they're claiming they have a religious freedom exemption to discriminate uh, well, you against know, this here, couple. Here in New York, we got Catholic homes and Jewish homes, and if you get government money, you cannot be discriminating uh, in our places on this basis. Uh, and by the way, in Illinois, we told you at length about the case of uh, uh, Mary Wetzel, who sued uh, a senior living center in, what is the name of that place? Niles, Illinois. Mm -hmm. She lost at the lower level, but she is awaiting a ruling where imminently from the Seventh Circuit. Uh, it, better news out of Pennsylvania where the Human Relations Commission has decided to redefine sex as a protected class to include sexual orientation, gender identity, uh, gender expression, uh, and non-binary status uh, as grounds for uh, uh, inappropriate discrimination in employment, housing, public accommodations, and education. So Pennsylvania has no statewide law. There are something like 50 cities and towns in Pennsylvania that yes. have non-discrimination laws, but the state does not have a statewide law. But now the statewide Human Rights, Human Relations Commission will consider those categories as included in sex discrimination. We told you last week in Indianapolis about Roncalli High School, where a lesbian was suspended. She's a guidance counselor named Shelley Fitzgerald because they found out that she got married to a woman in 2014. <laughs> Parents went to the board meeting to protest this because they like her, and so they canceled the board meeting. And they also said that, uh, oh, the board's not responsible for personnel matters anyway. All right. In California, the Senate and Assembly have passed uh, the law declaring conversion therapy uh, for gay people to be fraud, business fraud. Uh, this needs to be signed by the governor. They're reconciling the two bills, but this is good. It's important because normally it's just banned for minors, meaning, yep. you know, children. Yep. Uh, but this means you can't do it for adults if you charge. Right. Also in California, in San Bernardino County, the prison system will stop assigning LGBT inmates to the, you ready for this? Yep. Alternative <laughs> lifestyle yes. tank. It's now going to be the GBTI <laughs> unit. Uh, it's an ACLU case. 
Uh, uh, the settlement's not final. They're having a hearing about it in September. But, you know, they were denied access to, they were being denied access to drug rehabilitation, education programs, unable to participate in work programs, which would help them when they get on the outside. And All held that. in their cells 23 hours a day. Awful. They are get the plaintiffs are getting a million bucks in the settlement that they are splitting Congratulations among themselves. Congratulations to Jim Obergefell. He's being inducted into the Ohio Civil Rights Hall of Fame. Uh, all right. This case in Colorado. So right. you know that uh, the uh, uh, male same-sex couple uh, who had gotten married, I think out of the country, wanted to hold a reception in Colorado. This is before marriage was legal there. And they went to the Masterpiece Cake Shop and asked for a, a wedding cake. And the cake shop, when they figured this out, said, no. I have don't. a religious right. Yeah. Oh, no, 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 no. I have a First Amendment right <laughs> not to do it. So uh, this goes through I'm the an Col artist. Colorado Human Rights Commission. It goes through the courts in Colorado and eventually ends up in the Supreme Court, where the couple sort of loses because the Colorado right, Human Rights Commission is found to have made some extraneous remarks about religion is often used to discriminate. We don't have any problem with that comment That's because it's true. That's religion, it's a description. <laughs> it's a true statement. They're proud of it. But the Supreme Court decided to take the opportunity to dodge the underlying issues in the case by saying, oh, you can't say that, so, you know, we're not going to decide this for the couple at this point. We'll just... The uh, wishy-washy Anthony Kennedy who yeah. hasn't given us a good decision so in some time. So it turns out, we find out this week, that meanwhile there's a parallel case going on. On the day that the Supreme Court took the Masterpiece Cake Shop case, a trans woman who's an activist in Colorado and a lawyer and has tried various uh, sort of test case things called the Masterpiece Cake Shop and said, I want a birthday cake. It is going to be my birthday. And by the way, I'm also using this as an opportunity to celebrate the seventh anniversary of my transition. I want it pink on the inside and blue on the outside or vice versa. I can't remember. No, I think that's right. Blue on the outside, pink on the inside. And they said, oh, no, 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 no. We don't do uh, cakes for gender transition. We're not celebrating that. So she filed well, a complaint. Well, because gender is given by God. <laughs> Who is gender this is God <laughs> who's the scapegoat for everything? So uh, she complains. It's not determined by your perceptions or your feelings. It's determined by God. Or your perception of God. So she complains to the Colorado Human Rights Commission, Civil Rights Commission, and the Civil Rights Commission fines for her separately without any extraneous comments even before the supreme court condemned their extraneous comments in the other case so now the masterpiece cake shop is suing the civil rights commission and the officials of the state of colorado for uh, abridging their religious freedom by having any non-discrimination laws which is how the civil rights commission decides these cases that outlaw discrimination against uh, uh, sexual orientation or gender identity because religious freedom should cancel all of that and, and supersede all of I that. I mean, if, uh, you know, uh, Autumn Scar Scardia? Is Scardina. It? Scar oh, Scardina, I'm sorry. Uh, had just said, I just want a cake for, you know, blue on the inside or pink, yes. pink and blue, there would have been no problem? Correct. And just said it was a birthday cake. I think she's a lawyer, and I think yeah. she was trying to sort of establish whether yes. they... Yes, yes, she was being provocative, but well, nonetheless... Well, not provocative, she, but she was testing the limits. Yes, and she, uh, and she had a right to the cake. And we're going to find out from Brett Kavanaugh whether she has any rights. <laughs> we'll see. Um, Thank you to Clarksdale, Mississippi. They, the town has passed yes. a sexual orientation, gender identity, non-discrimination yes, well, no. law. Mississippi has a bunch of them, three of them now, I think. Yep. Uh, in, uh, in New York, trans activist Jennifer Louise Lopez, who's been on the show, she sued Mount Sinai Hospital for discrimination because they would not room her with other women in a detox unit. So, uh, uh, the New York City Commission on Human Rights investigated. They sent testers to the hospital and they found horrendous discrimination against transgender people. And now this hospital says we won't do it anymore. They're going to stop. Is it Mount Sinai? In. Mount Sinai are, Hospital uh, in New York. They premier facility for uh, trans surgery. I'm for just gender telling confirmation you what surgery. Happened. I'm just saying one hand doesn't know what the According other is doing. 
All right. All right. We better start zipping we, along because well, we have um, a big video uh, to show. Billionaire's Boys Club uh, premiered this week and with Kevin Spacey, and it raked in $126 on its opening day in eight <laughs> theaters. Uh, literally $126. <laughs> so, and then there's the case of... Uh, Asia Argento, uh, an actor and partner of the late Anthony Bourdain, an accuser of Harvey Weinstein, who paid $380,000 to settle a suit from actor Jer Jimmy Bennett, who says that uh, she sexually assaulted him when he was 17 and she was 37. Age of consent in California was 18. She denies 18. it. She denies it. Why'd she pay the money? Uh, she says Anthony Bourdain paid the money to just get rid of him. Okay. I, we don't know. All right. And, uh, and in Houston, anti-gay activists are asking Harris County to halt benefits for same-sex spouses. They've been doing this for years, and they're pushing the case. But they, they now want all spouses to be denied benefits. They want to say the they're gay... equal opportunity people. That's, yes. All right. Well, they're Christians. Uh, we are mourning this week the death of David McReynolds, uh, first uh, out gay person to run for president of the United States. Well, uh, I suppose so. I mean, I, I've known David for years. He was 88 years old. He died after a fall on August 17th. David was most famous as a, a member of the War Resisters League yeah. for 40 years, yeah. a big peace activist, learned everything he knew from Bayard Rustin, uh, also a peace activist. Um, Were, uh, uh, was an early anti-Vietnam War activist, burned his draft card in 1965 in Did Union any, Square. Yeah. We have a picture of David that. There's David, there's in, David. There's David in David. his glory, not too long ago. And uh, well, oh, there they are burning their draft cards, all in suits and ties. They were the first know. ones to do this, weren't yeah, they? Yeah, they were. And it was a big deal and a wonderful action, but, and no one should ever have gone to Vietnam. But David wrote an art. Now, David sort of was coming out in the 1940s, and he, he, he kind of hated himself for being gay. And then he met Alvin Ailey. Alvin Ailey. Had we're going to see all this in the video we're going to show you at the end of the show. And he came out publicly in 1969. We'll show you the video at the end of the show. All right. And then uh, Melanie K. Kantrowitz, uh, uh, who died uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, the mem uh, first of all, I want to let you know the memorial for her Saturday, September 15th. We have a picture from 3 to 6 p.m. at SEIU, 25 West 18th Street. She was the first director of Jews for Racial and Economic Justice, died of Parkinson's since at the age of 72, survived by our dear friend Leslie Kagan. She came out in the early 70s, edited lesbian literary and art journals, Sinister uh, Wisdom in the, uh, back in the 1980s. And Craig Zayden died this week, 69 years old. You know him uh, and his partner, his producing partner, Neil Maron, for producing a million different things, including several years of the Oscar broadcasts oh, yes. and the movie Chicago, which won a lot of Oscars. And he produced several of these NBC Live musicals in mm -hmm. the last few years. But he also uh, wrote a book about Stephen Sondheim in 1974. He produced the TV movie about Margaret Kammermeyer, Serving oh, in Silence. Uh, he produced Smash on NBC, the uh, what I thought was the great uh, Broadway uh, uh, series. And he produced a movie in 2001 called What Makes a Family with Brooke Shields and Cherry Jones as a lesbian couple. Cherry Jones oh, yes. dies and Brooke Shields has to sue for custody of their kids or something. He did, and he produced the Glad Media Awards. He was a, an enormous Hollywood producer who uh, also did a lot of gay stuff in movies and TV. And he died a, with complications from shoulder replacement surgery. This Yikes. was a real shocker. Yeah, well, surgery, it always can happen. Yeah. And uh, obviously we mourn the loss of Aretha Franklin, as, uh, not only as an artist, as you know, but of course as a civil rights activist. I love the fact that she offered to put up all the bail money for Angela Davis. That I was pretty know, radical. I know, that was fantastic. She says, I got my money from black people, and I want to be uh, use it to help our people. And she was a big viewer of MSNBC and involved politically uh, until the end. Uh, also, and on a lighter note, congratulations to Danny Drum, a member of the New York City Council, out gay many, many years, out gay teacher for many years, who got to throw out the first pitch at the New York Mets Pride Night. There he is, <laughs> Danny. Known Danny for 40 years. I would like to do that, but at the Red Sox games. All right, international news? Yes, zipping through. Uh, correction, uh, tur uh, Turkey is not part of the EU. Don't believe Andy, <laughs> huh, Moody said, it's part of NATO. <laughs>
mixed that up last uh, story week. Story of the week. In Austria, a refugee from Afghanistan, an 18-year-old gay uh, young man, was rejected for asylum by uh, Austria because... Uh, now, this the, officer wrote a 100-page report 100 on what, why this guy wasn't gay. Yeah. He didn't uh, act or he dress was, as gay. Uh, uh, neither your walk nor your behavior nor your clothing give the slightest indication that you could be gay. I found the potential for aggression <laughs> in this kid, which would not be expected from a homosexual. Uh, because he fought with others who, with whom he was yeah. housed. Uh, you were but he was a bit of a loner. Uh, you were described as having uh, not having many friends while in Austria. <laughs> Don't homosexuals tend to be rather social? Well, the officer was disciplined. He's appealing. The interior minister said they're working with the UN. The refugee is appealing. Yes. Yeah. The, the, oh, yes. The interior minister said that they're going to take some training from the United Nations on LGBT issues. In England, a star cricket player, Ben Stokes, had been uh, accused of assault because he beat up a couple of guys who, it turns out, were attacking a gay couple. Yes, I remember. So then the, he's now been acquitted of assault hooray. because he was helping them. There's some justice in the world. <laughs> In Taiwan, uh, we're looking at a deadline. The right wing is trying to collect signatures to put some really anti-LGBT uh, bills on the November ballot. They're trying to prevent marriage, which has been mandated by the court there. Two quick stories from Germany. They've created a third gender category called diverse under a court order. And they've also uh, uh, ag agreed to take a deported Nazi camp guard uh, Trump wanted this, and it was done at the urging of Richard Grinnell, who was the ambassador. No, this is the 95-year-old yes, that just from grabbed Jamaica, in Queens. From, from Jackson Heights, Queens. A gay neighborhood. Danny Drum's <laughs> district. He's out. Uh, in Honduras, the uh, parliament there has banned gay adoption, adoption by gay couples, and the uh, uh, LGBT community there is having to sue for marriage, even though the inter-American uh, court has mandated marriage for all Central and South American countries. The Supreme Court has accepted the marriage case there. In Yucatan, Mexico, the governor sent a marriage equality bill to the legislature. It would make it the 13th of 31 states to let you get married in the normal way, as opposed to having to go in a court, which everybody else seems to have to do. In Costa Rica, the legislature is debating marriage legality and civil unions. The court mandated marriage, but the new president is saying he supports civil unions, even though he doesn't even want that. Uh, and the LGBT community there is really unhappy. In Malaysia, the police raided a gay club to stop LGBT culture from spreading into society. Um, it's called Blue Boy Club. It's been there for 30 years. Police claimed it was drug addiction around the club, but a government minister said it was a crackdown on gays, and uh, the religious police ordered 20 men there to go for counseling. The Mr. Gay World contest has moved out of Hong Kong for next year because uh, the contest organizers are upset that discrimination is so rife in Hong Kong. So they're moving the competition to Cape Town, South Africa. Book your tickets now for April 28th through May 4th. And for those of you listening around the world, Outright Action International has published a global state of LGBTQ organizing the right to register. You can't even register a gay group in 85 out of 194 countries. Yeah, it's an extensive report uh, that is, updates what countries are doing what uh, and in uh, discriminating and uh, laws and everything else. Uh, Outright Action International. Outright international.org is their website. In British Columbia, Trinity Western Union, which is university, sorry, Trinity Western University has dropped its ban on sex outside of heterosexual marriage after the country refused to accredit their law school. Indeed. <laughs> And funny how an incentive works. And congratulations to Odessa, Ukraine, where they held their first Pride Parade. We have a little picture of that. There they Very are. Very brave to do it there. Hallelujah. Thank you. In AIDS, AIDS news. Denmark, uh, gay men can now give blood if you don't have sex for four months. And here it's a year, isn't it? Yeah, and uh, it, it can be that you haven't had sex for four months, or if you have a committed partnership, if you have one partner, and I guess you can prove that you're 
negative or whatever, they do extensive blood testing, as does everybody, and, but they seem to have a more liberal law. And we're looking forward to, uh, we're taping Wednesday. On Thursday, Logo is airing a documentary, and I think early Friday morning, too, called Quiet Heroes, about a lesbian doctor in Salt Lake who was treating people yes. with HIV and AIDS in the early 80s. I, I've seen it. It's actually quite good. And then I did a roundtable discussion with some other lesbian uh, AIDS activists to talk about lesbian participation in working against the epidemic, mostly because uh, people tend to say, oh, those great lesbians, they were so nice to the gay boys. Ooh, they there. were fierce activists and, and did a wonderful round table. Uh, it's called the Quiet Heroes Round Table. You can go to logotv.com and you can watch this. It's almost an hour, isn't it? And it it's is. a fa it's a it's a very funny but also very interesting discussion about from activists about how they got started, what kind of backgrounds you all had, and and t say who else is on it. Uh, Maxine Wolf, legendary uh, co-founder of the Lesbian Avengers, longtime Act Up veteran, uh, lesbian her story archives, currently working with revolting lesbians. Uh, to attack the Mercer family. Amanda Lug, Director of Advocacy at African Services Committee. Uh, and Stacy Smith, who I call the most arrested person I know, uh, who works and on Anne housing Northrup. issues. We'll tell you a little bit about herself on this show. Uh, it's, uh, it's a great group of people and a discussion I don't think uh, is uh, seen. Great show. So we should all have them in here and do it again, <laughs> or just run that. Maybe we, we, we could, could get logo, Maybe logo to will let us. Run. That'd be great. Okay. Uh, Take a week and off. And this weekend, uh, one of our favorite documentaries, Hot to Trot, about same-sex ballroom dancing and including at the Gay Games, is opening at the Quad here in New York City on West 13th Street. Uh, Q and A's with the director and dancer after the 7 p.m. shows on Friday and Saturday, and it'll be opening around the country in uh, LA. If you go to the Hot to Trot website, you can find out all about that. This won the Audience Award at the New Fest uh, Film Festival last okay. year. Okay, entertainment news? Yeah. Well, Garrett Clayton has come out, the former Disney star. At the age of 27, there he is on the cover of Out Magazine, because I guess he was trying to tell us something when he played gay porn star Brent Cargan in King Cobra. He <laughs> says his new movie, uh, Reach, Reach uh, pushed him out because it dealt with themes around suicide and high school bullying. He's been with his partner, Blake Knight, for a long time, he says. Uh, he's most famous for D Disney's Teen Beach movie and, he was and also Teen Beach movie 2. And he was also in uh, Hairspray Live on NBC, produced by Craig Zayden. All right. You can, uh, yeah. I can blow my nose. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, also Put the out, camera on her. Also out this week is uh, 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 Josie <laughs> Tota. Sorry. Who you know as J.J. Tota. There uh, she is on Champions, the uh, NBC series. I, I like the series. I watched it because uh, yeah. she was on it as a young gay boy, and uh, it was a cute yeah. show. Uh, Mindy Kaling, uh, who she's sitting with there, is the originator of the show. So now she's come out as trans with some trepidation. She talks about how it was a little scary, but uh, now she's out as Josie. I went to see Getting the Band Back Together, despite the bad reviews, uh, but I'm a critic on Broadway, and I just want to, that's Marilou Henner who stars in it with the band people. I just want to say it's more evidence that lots of people are easily amused. <laughs> Well, I was not easily amused by the movie Mission Impossible. Oh. Now, I, I you know. Mission Impossible, what, 10? <laughs> I, I like high art. I like low art. And I will go to uh, a good action movie, not any of these superhero things. Yeah. I hate all that. But uh, Mission Impossible, the new one, got good reviews. And a friend wanted to go to the movies. And so there were other movies we wanted to see, but we wanted to wait to see with another friend. So we said, all right, she won't want to see this. We'll go see this. It is awful. It is one of the worst things I've ever seen. Completely pointless, totally boring, horrible. Do not go see Mission Impossible. So Glenn Close this week gave an interview. And you know she won an Oscar nomination for playing Albert uh, knobs in 2012, a woman masquerading as a man, she would say. She said producer, producers need to go out of their way to cast trans actors, but 
they should cast the best actor acting as a craft, and I personally think I should be able to play anyone. She played Margaret Kammermeyer uh, in, yeah. in, the, in a TV movie, I think it was. Well, uh, lesbian. And, as I have also read recently, and it doesn't come as any surprise, uh, until there is an equal playing field, and everybody can play anyone, including uh, trans actors playing non-trans uh, people, uh, we need to do a little uh, deeper work to get people played appropriately. And of course, Scarlett Johansson was going to play that transgender role uh, and uh, was protested and demurred and said, okay, no, I, I won't do that. I read that she's the highest paid actress in the world right now. Because she does some of these uh, superhero uh, movies. I see. That's where the money is. And uh, the uh, Tony War Award winning director, Vivian Matalon, died this week at the age of 88. He did Mornings at Seven many years ago. 88 years old. So uh, we came in, uh, with the death of David McReynolds, we came across a little documentary that was done by a guy named Anthony I Giannoco. Have, well, have, no, let's get his name right. Let's I, do get his I name right. I You're the one down. who has it written down, so. I do have it written down somewhere. Okay. Oh, Anthony. <laughs> Apologize. Anthony is his name. And he Gino. did, he. Uh, Giacchino. Yeah. And uh, he did this 15-minute uh, documentary about David McReynolds, and uh, it's, uh, it's him talking about his life in many areas as a peace activist, how he first came to pacifism, uh, how he, as an out gay man, ran for office. He was blamed for throwing the 2000 election to uh, to George Bush instead of Al Gore it, because he got some votes in Florida on a confusing got some ballot. Votes. He got 5,602 votes nationwide. He got 2,903 where the butterfly ballot was in, in Palm Beach County. Or was I'm it? not blaming him. No, Al no, no. Gore should have gotten more votes and Al Gore should have contested the election statewide, which he didn't do. He gave up. Uh, but I know David, those Democrats, you got to start showing some fight. <laughs> but uh, David McReynolds, among his many uh, activities and yes. famous things, uh, showed up as an asterisk in the uh, presidential right. election. By the way, he may have only gotten 5,600 votes then, but uh, he ran against Schumer in 2004. I probably voted for him because he got 36,942 <laughs> votes. We were, no, we're not terribly happy with the uh, Senate minority leader. Anyway, uh, he died at age 88 in a fall uh, here in New York and... Uh, we had him on the show when he ran for president in 2000. And we thought that you would enjoy uh, hearing about this uh, uh, well-known peace activist and, uh, and just activist in general. So here is the... My name is David McReynolds. I was born in Los Angeles on October 25th, 1929, and my parents always felt that I was the cause of the Depression, which occurred just two or three days after my birth. In high school at George Washington High, as a student, I was fascinated by current events, and I followed the war with enthusiasm, with fascination, the map showing the Russian retreat or advance where the Allied forces were. And I remember two headlines. One of them was, uh, 1,000 bombers make Hamburger of Hamburg. And another was, 800 bombers blast Bremen. Germany had been so devastated that they couldn't cover all the damage. So then in 1951, I'm walking through Germany. And at first, my reactions are entirely politically correct. I'm looking at the destruction and realizing this was the result of the capitalist drive for power, that the working class suffered the most, which is true, that the large business corporate structure was back in business. But it was seeing Bremen, seeing the damage, realizing I was the kid who had been so enthusiastic about the bombs falling, and then seeing the chaos the bombs had caused, I really uh, had a profound, genuine re religious experience. And I went up to an old lady 
And then I pointed at the ruins and I said, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, and I broke down. The nature of violence and war embraces both sides. It embraces both the Nazis and what we did during World War II. And it was the point at which I really had an insight into war. I was the one who had dropped the bombs. We're on the Lower East Side of New York City. We're at 60 East 4th Street. You're in my apartment where I've lived for about 50 years. Once you come in, then you've got an enormous mess. You will see large numbers of compact discs, far more than I can justify. On the table, you will see a stack of books, which I would hope to get through before I drop dead, uh, but that's increasingly unlikely. I clean stuff up and put it in the bathtub when people come so that the chairs are empty and it takes me several days to clear the apartment enough for friends to come over. And then it takes two or three days to put the stuff back where it came from. On the question of why I became a socialist, part of it was not Marx. I've moved closer to Marx over the years, and I would, in a general sense, think of myself as a democratic Marxist. Marx himself, just parenthetically, was profoundly democratic. He never anticipated the coup d'etat that Lenin carried out in Russia. But I had not really read or been familiar with Marx. I came into the Socialist Party partly because of poets like Kenneth Patchen, who had uh, who are very powerful in their poems. No man can own what belongs to all. No man can lie when all are lied to. I also became a socialist when my economics cl class, which is a good professor, explained that 3% unemployment was the lowest you could expect under capitalism, and that was necessary. And I thought 3% unemployment was too high. But I became a socialist because it struck me that capitalism was a lousy system. Among other things, it made my father work as an advertising man when he would have been much better off doing something else. He would have preferred to be a minister. He was a devout Christian. He was a salesman because he had to put bread on the table for the family, and it didn't do good things for him. To see what the system had done to him, uh, what it had done to so many people, most of the work that people do is pointless work and they do it because they must earn a living to provide food. And I want a society where the people are more able to work and work hard, but at jobs that they enjoy and that make a contribution to the world around them. And we don't live in that kind of society. Meow, meow, meow. Shaman, 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 you're not going to talk to me? Meow. All right. That's good. No, don't jump on the lights, okay? Wow. Well, because it's very complicated. Very complicated. And 1949 was a very significant year for me, partly because that was the year that I had met Alvin Ailey in the men's room at UCLA and decided that I was homosexual. I was 19, Alvin Ailey was 18. He was not famous. He was not yet a dancer. We met in a bathroom, which was a gay meeting place at UCLA, and I became involved with Alvin. I wish I could say we had had a long love affair, but we did not. But I got to know Alvin very well. He would go over to his house in about once a week and talk about poetry. He introduced me to the poetry of E. E. Cummings, of William Carlos Williams of Kenneth Patchen. I was certainly was very much in love with Alvin. And Alvin then went on, of course, to become a major choreographer, founded the Ailey Dance Company. But I owe him an enormous debt. Alvin helped me accept being homosexual because he was not guilty. He was not nervous. He was not ashamed. And I had viewed the whole business of homosexuality as very deeply shameful and very, very wrong. 
And Alvin was the first person I met who was sweet, charming, good looking, uh, but absolutely seemed free of guilt. And that was very liberating to me. That in itself was remarkably liberating to me. I think my real commitment to pacifism occurred when I heard Bayard Rustin speak in 1949. He was, in many ways, an essential part of the civil rights struggle, along with A. Philip Randolph and Martin Luther King, Jr. He worked with them both very closely. Bayard was an absolutely essential figure of the two people in my own life that I owe my thinking, my analysis to, and A.J. Musty was the other. And my relationship with A.J. was that of, of one of his lieutenants. He was an advisor to Martin Luther King, Jr. He was the figure around whom the Vietnam movement coalesced. But uh, these were the two men who meant the most to me personally and, and, and did, in fact, change my life and direct it. Oh, yes, I have a large FBI file, about 400 pages and also a CIA file, but I'm not sure I have that any longer, and there was also naval or air intelligence files, all of which I got under the Freedom of Information Act. I think probably the first entry in the FBI files would have been from the early 1950s when I was an active uh, student radical at UCLA. Uh, I had become active in the radical community after I joined the Socialist Party and also while well, a pacifist working on draft resistance work. Now, my file is larger than most people, but it's not very incriminating. And for the most part, it was accurate, ironically. I mean, they document my drunkenness. They document my homosexuality. They have me down as a drug addict, which I think was not quite fair. I'm not. But I'd certainly smoked marijuana and, and still do. What I thought was weird and bugged me was that they had me down as a Trotskyist based on the report of the Los Angeles County Communist Party's Control Commission. And I thought, why is the FBI taking the Communist Party's word for my beliefs? I'm not a Trotskyist. I have never been a Trotskyist. So they made a few mistakes. The longest job I ever had was working for the War Resisters League from 1960 to 1999. And my job changed over the years from being field secretary to being, in a sense, the spokesperson for the League. To be a war resister means to challenge the institution of war and to resist all wars, defensive or aggressive, even at the cost of going to prison or at the risk of your life. Now, whether I would be willing to risk my life, I don't know. Would I be willing to risk going to prison? Yes, I would. So to be a war resister, means to view war itself as a crime against humanity, not the soldiers who are engaged in the fighting. They're trapped by the structure. In the Vietnam War, it was clear that to the degree that you can say one side is right and one side is wrong, it was clear the Vietnamese were right. But that doesn't mean for a moment that I would buy weapons for the Vietnamese. My job during the Vietnam War was to get the Americans out of Vietnam. It wasn't to decide how the Vietnamese were going to wage their own struggle. So we resisted that war actively and organized to do everything we could to slow down and impede the American war machine. I'm holding in my hands a copy of the butterfly ballot as it appeared in Florida for the 2000 election with the names of the candidates for president, including mine. And if you look at the ballot, you can see how hard it would be to be sure you're hitting the right thing. So there are people who voted for me because they wanted to. But someone could argue that by running on the Florida ballot, the number of votes I got tipped the election to Bush. And granted, the same thing could have been said about the other three candidates but I think that's in some ways an unfair question because the real question in my mind is why Gore did not ask for a recount in the whole state. Was there ever any chance that you were going to be elected president? <laughs> Good God, no. Uh, not, not, not in a thousand years.
I ran for president twice. The reason for running for president was to present a program to people to educate them to use the running as an educational tool. Also to humanize the concept of socialism. It's very easy to demonize socialism if you haven't met or seen or heard a socialist. Much harder if you've actually talked to one. In 1980 I ran really because I wanted to run. We were in a very dark period in the Cold War and I ran primarily in order to talk about nuclear disarmament, which I did. I spent most of that campaign talking about disarmament. 2000 I was drafted and I had not planned to run again, but I was honored to be asked and I did. I am a cinema I am a cinematographer Oh, I am a cinematographer The reason you don't kill someone is because each human life is unique and irreplaceable. And I walked away from New York City And that you want to do everything you can to save that life to live out its natural course. To extinguish a human life is a terrible thing. I am a religious atheist in that I think there is something unique and real about each of us which will return in some way to some source. But the reason you don't kill people is because they are a shadow of yourself they are a part of you, you just don't realize it. When you look more closely at them, you say, gee, this person is my brother or my sister. So that's why you don't kill people. And I walked away from California And I walked away from everything that shone and I walked away from everything I live for. Uh, uh, deep thanks to Anthony Giacchino for allowing us to run that wonderful film. And goodbye, David McReynolds. Uh, and thank you for your life of peace. I would say you don't kill people because it's unethical. Well, there you are. Good, but don't do it. That's great. <laughs> so uh, far, so good <laughs> that I know of. <laughs> And I ran for office once, of course, as the vice presidential yes. candidate of the AIDS Cure Party. And Anne's ticket came in 20th in the country. <laughs> yes, it did. And we are going to we are going to put a link to that film on our email and a link to the logo special that Anne did with the uh, other lesbian AIDS activists. Yeah, uh, yeah, they're interesting people, and I think uh, we don't hear from AIDS activists enough, and certainly not from the lesbians who were in a, such an important part of the movement. And, fa and, they and all, still are. you all led fascinating lives. I, well, I found my colleagues fascinating, and as you say, very, very funny. There is a lot Laugh of laughter. Laugh out loud, L O L. <laughs> All right, so Gay USA will be back next week with Andy and Chris Cooper, and I'll be back the week after that. See you then. Bye.